everybody and welcome to our second arable conversation of the day. I'm going to just very briefly introduce the chair for the session, who is my colleague Mike Rivington, a land use systems modeler based at the James Hutton Institute, who's going to chair and introduce. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much, Ali. Uh, thanks so much for coming along. Good afternoon. Welcome to Arable Scotland. Um, this session is uh, Market Updates and Arable Choices. Uh, quite an interesting title. You can sort of add all sorts of things onto that that you, uh, you might like. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panelists. First of all, we have Julian Bell, Principal Consultant, SAC Consulting. And Julian is an agricultural economist specializing in the markets and economics of arable crops. He is also increasingly delivering carbon reduction and mitigation projects across a range of agricultural sectors through SIUC's AgriCalc Carbon Tool. Uh, Julian previously worked for AHDB as a senior grain market economist, as well as a practical farm management. Uh, and next we have Megan Hesketh from AHDB. She's a senior analyst for cereals and oilseed markets at AHDB. Megan works in a team of market specialists producing key analysis pieces on grain and oilseed markets. Next we have Julian South. And Julian is Executive Director of the Maltsters Association of Great Britain and he has been since 2016. Uh, and his previous roles in different parts of food industry including agriculture, ADAS, uh, brewing with Carlsberg Tetley in Burton-on-Trent and confectionery uh, for Cadbury and Bourneville. Uh, and finally, we have Phil Bowell from Yara. My apologies, he's on the next page. Uh, apologies, Phil. I have. Oh, no, there you go. Uh, so it's from Yara Vita Product Manager, UK and Ireland. He has just returned to UK commercial business following 18 months in a global technical and portfolio management role. He is an agronomist with 20 years practical experience. So the process is going to be, each, each panelist is going to talk for about three minutes uh, and then we will have question and answers. Um, so I first of all want to set the context for this discussion uh, and it's going to be sort of everything and anything really. Um, war in Ukraine, climate and biodiversity crisis, cost of living and inflation, concerns about food security and need for improved resilience of the food system and equality within it need for multiple objectives from land, providing ecosystem services, importance of maintaining a profitable and sustainable agri-food business. So, how do we rebalance the food system to meet all of these challenges? So that's just a, a snapshot of all the things that are going on uh, at the moment. We're living in unprecedented times with so many different things happening all at once. So, um, I'm just hopefully set setting the scene uh, and now I'd like to hand over to, to Julian. Uh, for his three minutes pitch. Thank you. Thank you. All right. good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think my message, I suppose, is there's so many things in the world that are seeming to be out of control that the emphasis really is there's even more pressure that farmers and others in the whole grain industry are more in control of what they're doing. <coughs> and I think, <coughs> excuse me, Ukraine, obviously, there's there many of us can be talking about Ukraine. I think uh, we can't get away from the fact that it is such a big producer that it being knocked out to varying degrees this year, possibly next year and beyond, uh, it just makes it a harder, a harder hill for the rest of the world to climb in terms of replacing Ukraine. Uh, having said that, um, the best cure for high prices is high prices, and we are seeing if things coming forward. Other parts of the world are stepping up production You'll know yourself if it's prof profitable to, to produce and grow grain and grow a bit more. And I think <clears throat> what people don't often overlook is that it doesn't actually take a huge shift in up or down in production to really shift the price. So yes, it, clearly it looks um, difficult that those uh, shortfalls in Ukraine will be met, but there are farmers around the world trying. Um, now the other issue is the fertilizer, clearly it, it is uh, scary how expensive it's become. But again, just along with oil prices, fuel prices, fertilizer prices, there's a commodity super cycle going on. And it's, it's, just not, it's not just grain that's going up, everything else. So in a way, it's a good sign because it's telling you that the world's short of a lot of really important things. 
uh, and as farmers we are lucky that we can produce, uh, produce one of those which is, is food and other grain. But the issue is managing it. So the key thing is, if fertiliser is high, then when you're paying for it, sell some grain. I think there's no escaping that one. Um, looking forward, there's one or two other things just to point out. I think this Ukraine crisis is sort of showing us about resilience and security is actually really important. We've forgotten about that. Lots of cheap gas, lots of cheap uh, grain and other things. The world got a wee bit used to that. Just a wake up call. The benefits here, of course, we can provide as, as, as farmers locally secure supplies of food and grain for our local market. So I think the, the value of that has got to be seen to be higher. Um, and I think we'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that point and pass on to the others. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, Megan Hesker from the HDB. So I think this is a very important conversation considering the volatility in prices that we are seeing at the moment um, in terms of those global markets. We have seen prices come down in recent weeks, harvest pressure and as prices are pretty high, we are seeing some concerns around recession, demand rationing, um, but in terms of what is happening in Scotland, we've got a pretty good idea of what crops are looking like in the ground, but I think there's a lot of conversation around demand. Um, so we've got distilling demand for wheat, um, which is pretty strong, and brewing demand for barley as well. So um, question is more around animal feed. Um, so we are feeling livestock margins been squeezed, and how is that is that playing into the supply chain um, with less guarantee for customers um, with consumer mar consumer disposable income being squeezed as well. And we're seeing that not just in Scotland, in the UK, but globally. Um, other points to note, we are seeing those recessionary concerns. Um, so as prices are a lot higher, um, definitely seeing demand rationing. But in the past couple of weeks, we have seen prices come down on a global market scale. And we are finding demand at those levels um, because the demand and supply level is so tight and the market is very sensitive to any new news. Um, we, we are seeing that, that level of support within demand. Um, and also a few questions going forward for this season. Could we see some exports? Like I say, global demand is tight. The EU is pretty tight in terms of their supply as well, um, with a different in trade dynamics going forward from the war between Russia and Ukraine. We are seeing EU origins, um, pretty strong demand. Um, so where the EU is going to source from as well is, is something to think about going forward. I think in terms of a lot of the conversations I've been having now is around Harvest 23, because those input prices are really quite high. We're thinking about prices for wheat around the 230 mark. So it really is managing that risk, um, understanding where your costs are. Um, and I'm hearing a lot more people around thinking about forward selling, um, especially if they've forward purchased fertilizer as well, just as a way of mitigating and managing that risk that we see in a highly volatile market, uh, not just in terms of those prices for wheat, but also these input prices as well. And looking ahead, I think it's important to um, think about the challenges that we face now in terms of those input crops and um, input costs. But looking forward, more and more people are looking at cover crops and pulses um, in some areas of Scotland. And I think it's really important to consider the future policy in Scotland as well. Um, so in terms of the session that we had earlier around biodiversity, where is the policy going forward for Scotland? Because I think that'll definitely play into um, cropping decisions going forward around sustainable food production um, and what goals are going forward. So there's a lot of factors at play and it is a difficult decision. Um, I really do appreciate that, but that's sort of a, a pricey for me. So if I pass on to Julian Sam. Okay, thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it feels like I've been on trial with a three-minute reprieve to save our souls. And the last time I held a mic was a karaoke bar, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. What I'll, so I, I'm here representing the malting industry in uh, Great Britain. Uh, so that's uh, in, in, in largely England and Scotland. Uh, uh, I, and I'm going to give you some facts and figures in terms of... And, it, and indicate the importance of the malting industry in, in Scotland specifically. So we're, we have 11 company members. There are something like 18 malting companies in total. In, and uh, some of those are quite small. And some are 
associated with larger distilling companies, uh, the, the, li the likes of Beam Santori that would operate small floor maltings. But a significant number of our maltsters are also quite very large industrial scale pr production plants. And we, we, we represent 98% of the malting production in the UK. The 2% two per two tends to be the very small players that have just got a, like a display maltings for, for, uh, as part of a visit visitor centre. So the malting industry itself, the, it's, it's largely uh, down the east of the country, so East Anglia, up the east coast, up to the north of Scotland. There's a little bit across on Isla, a bit lar large maltings at Port Ellen, uh, and, uh, and then there's the occasion occasional one inland, like in Burton-on-Trent, which is a legacy of the days when brewers had their own, mal own malting companies in-house. The, uh, the reason for the East, of course, is to be proximi in proximity to the mal malting barley growing, and it's, it's a very, still a very, very significant uh, factor to have a maltings in proximity to where you can source your barley. So within Scotland, that's on the Murray, on the Murray Firth coast, sort of down the east towards Edinburgh, across an island. And there is actually one small member on Orkney uh, so supplying uh, Highland Park whiskey. So our major customers, are, it used to be the brewers, and, but now it's a distilling industry. And something like 50% 50, 50 of production now goes into Scotch whiskey. Uh, about a third, so about 30, 30, just over 30% goes into, into beer. Uh, something like 11% is exported uh, to 50, 50 countries. And British malt is very well renowned in Japan uh, and, in, and in the USA. And then there are lots of other countries uh, that take small quantities, for, lastly for craft. Uh, a small percent of malt goes into food, and most of us will probably have had some malt this morning and on, on our breakfast cereals. A, a malt extract is often used as a flavour uh, flavor enhancer or a, or a sort of flavour giver in foods, and Maltesers and, the, and, the, and, and so on. So barley requirements. So we, we purchase 1.8 million tonnes of malting barley a year, a year, and that's pretty, pretty, remained pretty static for the last few years and, and looks, it, it, in fact, we were quite resilient even during COVID, the, the amounts didn't dip too significantly, which shows the resilience of the sector. About half of that, so about 900,000 tonnes is in Scotland, and of that, something like 97% is uh, spring barley. There is a small amount, about 30,000 tonnes of winter barley in Scotland, which is going, going into, into beer. And we must remember that we think of malt and barley and whisky in Scotland, but Scotland also has a, has a proud brewing herit heritage and, and a growing brewing heritage. And Brewdog, not far f north from here, have a very, very large and growing uh, uh, brewing operation. So, so the vast majority, which is in Scotland, uh, it makes something like 90% of what goes into Scotch whisky is actually grown and malted in Scotland. And that's really important. And the provenance within the distilling sector has become much more, uh, much more significant in, in recent years. So what malts uh, are looking for, they're looking, they're looking for barleys from the Malting Barley Committee list, which is largely Laureate, Diablo and Sassy. Uh, they're, looking, they're looking for SQC assurance, or, and, and, they're and they're looking for high-quality grain with good germination characteristics, correct nitrogen, and, uh, and the correct moisture, which, which will be a real challenge uh, uh, this year if there's a wet harvest. So I think I'm probably getting to the end of the three minutes, so I've got a nod. Yeah. So the challenges within the sector, uh, gas prices. Most maltsters are exceptionally high users of gas, and just to put it in context, well, one of our biggest maltings in Berwick-on-Tweed uses more gas than the entire town of Berwick-on-Tweed. Uh, so there is a huge uh, sort, of, uh, sort of concern about gas pricing. The opportunities, the opportunities are a very tight, a good, good supply chain. We work very well uh, with, with growers. And we have an international barley hub which will, which will support us for our research going forward. So that's me finished. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, obviously, you'll you'll tell I'm not a uh, I'm not a local. Um, and to all my fellow uh, Englishmen in the audience, the best news of the day is England have just won and beat India by seven wickets at cricket. So um, happy days. Um, <clears throat> why am I here? Other than to represent Yara and probably um, 
get a bit of flack about the price of fertilizer because nobody else wanted to sit here. Um, genuinely, I was always taught influence and control the things you can and don't waste energy worrying about the things you can't. And thankfully, so far today, the conversations we've had out there have been excellent. Uh, they have been about how we manage our crops going forward. Um, and that's fundamentally what I want to focus on. And that's what us as Yara spend a lot of effort doing. Um, the supply chain issues and the, the, the factors affecting the supply chain are not going away. Um, you know, if the war in Ukraine ends tomorrow, is everything going to get back to normal quickly? No. Gas prices are continuing to rise. We're in the middle of summer and gas prices are continuing to rise. When we look at the supply chain through other elements of our business, so our folio nutrition business, um, it, it's things that you just don't think of where a, a rail link gets broken in eastern Ukraine, which cu cuts off a supply of raw material, of product we bring into Yorkshire, um, that we manufacture then to ship out to 70 other countries around the globe. That has led to the raw material of that particular product quadrupling in the last six months. So for me, what we need to be focusing on is enhancing our crop performance. And that means some tough decisions. It may mean that we take areas of fields out of production. You know, there's various tools out there in the marketplace that can help you produce cost of production maps. They're not ours, but there's people doing that. It takes bold decisions. When we then plant our crops, we buy our inputs. As has already been said, we need to offset that risk. That's not my department. My department is agronomy. Um, we then need to look at maximizing our crop potential. We do that through learning, through the use of tools, through measuring, through keeping our soils healthy, and a lot of the conversations we've had this morning, um, this is not new. This is old-fashioned crop husbandry, but it's been lost in the last 10 to 15 years because it's been very easy to reach for a can of product, a bag of fertilizer. Times are changing. We need to get back to farming how we used to farm. And that's not to say we all need to don sandals red shorts and go completely off in a different direction we just need to do what we do well because we can control that um, and the old adage is what's the difference between a good farmer and a poor farmer it's about a week and that hasn't changed so for me um, that's what we're about is w let's control what we can control and we have the tools and the advice to do that, working with a lot of the industry partners we work with, some of which are in the room today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, panelists. Um, I would just like to remind you that this is a, a family show. It has been uh, videoed. Uh, I'm now going to open the floor up for, for questions, so if you please... Uh, present them in a respectful manner with uh, clean language. It would be uh, very much appreciated. There is a roving microphone. So please, uh, any questions from the floor? Now that's a surprise. I thought there was gonna be a forest of arms going up. Oh, sorry, I missed a gentleman there, please. Hi, my name is Gordon Rennie. Uh, I thought it was very relevant you were saying about the cost of inputs and using them prudently. At the present time, the Scottish government's actually coming to your help in the sense that there's large areas of good arable land not growing anything as it either converts to organic or is under, under some different initiatives. Do you think when there's a world food crisis where millions of people should be displaced, don't you think government policy should be aimed at producing as much food as possible? Thanks for the question. Is there anybody in particular you were directing that to? I like, I like the look of the bloke at the end with the beard.
uh, not speaking on behalf of Yara, but, but myself, 100% I agree with you. You know, we should. Um, but I also think we've got to think of environmental sustainability as well, not just economic. You know, for me, you know, we do have one planet and we need to look after that and we need to look after our resources. So I think there's a balance to be struck and I think we've not got there yet. Where I think, I think if we're all being honest that in the last sort of 20 years, the balance has probably gone too far into intensive agriculture, perhaps. Um, overuse of artificial fertilizers, overuse of pesticides. Um, we need to move the balance back. Can we move that into organic production? Uh, I don't believe we can because we are not going to feed a growing population. It's just not possible. Um, I'm not going to get into um, growing crops for energy as well because that's another big, big topic which we could sit here for, for days and debate. But that's another area which is questionable. Um, certainly I'm from Lincolnshire right halfway down down England and there's vast areas of grade one quality silt land being taken out of vegetable production to grow maize for AD plants is that right I don't know it clearly makes business sense for somebody um, but yeah I think we need a balance because you know, we, we must not lose sight of environmental sustainability as well, in, in my opinion. I, I, I'll comment on that as well. I mean, that was, a, that was a great first question, and there were so many different angles to that as well. So firstly, taking my MAGB hat, I've put my personal hat on. Uh, my understanding is there's plenty of food. It's about the economics and affordability and distribution. And uh, yeah, we do need to grow, to, to grow, to grow more. Uh, but of the right foods and, and so on. Sec second uh, sort of comment, and I think this was picked up broadly uh, sort of just at the end of the last session, which is whether growing for whiskey uh, is really growing a food. Uh, I mean, I would say that, uh, I mean, if you look at the contribution to the economy, five and a half billion value added to the UK economy from Scotch whiskey. Go, go, goes a long way, and that's bigger than any other. It's the single biggest uh, contributor from the food sector into, into the economy, and we do need a strong economy. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the distilling supply chain and the brewing supply chain are very much domestic, and our big concern is in the future, how will we, how will we service that in terms of in, its increased requirements? There are 140 distilleries now, and that's growing year on year. Projections are that that will grow substantially uh, in the future, and, and we would like to continue with a domestic supply, uh, because where, where better to grow barley than, uh, than, than, than Scotland? Uh, I'll pass on to anybody else that would like to comment on that point. Thank you very much. I think it's a very good question. I think food security is definitely something that is on everybody's lips at the moment, a topic that everybody's talking about. But I think when we're considering food security, it's also sustainable food production and not just con concentrating on this crisis because you're right, input costs are a huge challenge for a lot of people, but also looking forward um, to the future challenges as well. So I think it is finding that balance. Just to add that, the, you know, that it's hard to escape the economics and the cost of it, because I mean, um, most farms are not caused by lack, lack of food, like people say, it's, it's people haven't got enough income or whatever to pay for it. So um, ec profitable product, food production got to remain profitable if we're gonna supply what's needed. But also, I think at the moment is a lesson, some of those speakers have said the same, you know, an efficient use of, of inputs, which are global commodities, there's more competition for them. On farms, we've got to use them efficiently to produce food. And that message is sort of, is certainly being, no one needs a carbon tax on fertilizer at the moment, that's for sure. Uh, everyone's very focused on using it efficiently. So I think we can feed people, but it's all about uh, reappraising what we're doing and make the most of our resources. Uh, thank you, George. I have a question. Thank you very much, uh, George Laurie. I'm a director of James Hutton. Uh, for too long, farmers have been price takers, 
Does this give us, with the change just now, does this give us the opportunity to be price setters? And I'll direct this one to Julian first, but I'd like to hear the rest of the panel's uh, views. I, I kind of predicted that would uh, come at some point, but I didn't expect you, George. <laughs> I'll forgive you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there needs to be a fair, pr a fair, a fair price. I mean, I, I, ca I, I can't... I can't speak uh, specifically about specific uh, member companies because uh, we, we, re we represent the whole, the whole sector. And I think in terms, in terms of cost, this does, the, the extra costs, these need to be, and things like, move, as we move into more sustainable agriculture, which will cost, we need to spread that along the supply chain. And I think there's every evidence that, uh, that the price, the pricing structure is beginning to resolve itself at the, pr at the moment of, in time. I think the, the most, the biggest difficulty is the volatility and, uh, and cash flow. And I think that's going to some, be something which in the next 12 months we're all going to be, challenge, all going to be challenged by. Every, every section of the supply chain has an added cost at this, mo at this moment in time. And costs need to be you know, resolved across the supply chain to, to, deal, with, to deal with that. And, uh, and remember as well that as, multi as malting companies, we're also, we also supply customers, and they supply customers too. And it's the end customer, the one that's drinking the beer or drinking the whiskey, which is really dictating what, where they want the, you know, the, the, the sort of supply chain to go. So some of the sustainability challenges are being passed down to us, and they've had it passed down to them. So we, we, need, we need to uh, work as an integrated supply chain. And I think we are a very good integrated supply chain, for more, more so than in, uh, in some sectors. And I'm just going to say as well, that my, my time working for Cadbury was interesting. I worked with supply chains where there was, there was nothing like the integration that we have now. If you want to source coconut from Malaysia or Indonesia, you've got to send somebody out there that's going to be pretty much stationed out there full, full time. And, and as for worrying about assurance standards, well, the, the only way around that is to send an expensive auditor from your company, and the, you're probably going to be rubbing shoulders with the Nestle's and the Mars's of the world. So we, we have a pretty good uh, system here at the moment. We should cherish that. Yeah, I'd like to add on, on that. And I think you're right, supply chain collaboration is really going to be key within this. Um, we prices definitely follow global markets and we've seen a lot of volatility across that um, in terms of the input costs in terms of prices that we are seeing for wheat barley commodities as well and um, so I really do think to add on to Julian's point slide supply chain collaboration really will be key on that front just to say that yeah yeah it's it's the cat it's the risks are, are so high <clears throat> and it goes back to contracts which are available for cereals, which is a huge, when you look at other sectors that are really struggling at the moment, that is a big issue. So the cereal industry has got a grip to grips on all sides about forward pricing and getting contracts in place. Uh, they're just going to be more nimble and more flexible given the, the volatility in all inputs. But, you know, given the outlay to grow crops, uh, you know, the farmers really need to be that assurance. But, you know, I think the industry has moved on massively and, and everyone's willing to have those discussions. Phil, is there anything you want to come? No, I, I, I sort of hear what, what, what everybody's saying. Um, again, my concern is um, the, the, the farmer is now being asked to be so much. Um, and the one thing I think that hasn't worked particularly well in UK agriculture over the decades has been cooperation. When you compare us to you know, other, con other, other markets in Europe not too far away, um, you know, perhaps now more than ever is the time for farmers to cooperate um, because you're going to need to employ some really good marketing people. And I don't think it's a skill set that farmers have. And farmers, should you have that? Because, again, I'll go back to what I said at the start. Your skill set is out in the fields. Nobody knows your farms better than you know your farms. Um, and that's where your focus should be, to, to maximize your crop potential. So for me, cooperatives come into a place now more than ever to ensure that your grain, et cetera, is marketed and sold to the best it can be. 
but you have to place that faith in those organizations to do that in my humble opinion okay thank you uh, question from the lady in the white jacket please Thank you. I'm Colleen McCullough from Soil Association Scotland. Um, so I just wanted to come back to the question about producing enough food and using land for producing food rather than other things or um, sort of energy production, but that's maybe a, a, a whole different discussion. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on the comment about organic not being able to, to feed everyone. Um, and I suppose you might think I'm biased being from Soil Association. Um, and we sort of have organic farms, but I think organic production systems do have a place and aspects of organic approaches have a place in the wider system. So I think, again, it's about that collaboration and learning from each other, which organisations like AHDB um, and FAS do quite a lot of. And I know the Scottish Government has pledged to double the area of organic land in Scotland for producing food. Um, so I think it's, it's um, part of that sort of bigger picture look at things, how things integrate and how people work together. So, you know, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. People will have different approaches that, that work for them. Um, but I think organic approaches do have a place in the discussion around producing enough food for everybody. Um, so uh, uh, the question that comes out of that is maybe directed to AHDB. Um, if you're seeing more farmers using approaches like what organic farmers use, like legumes and cover crops and managing their soil differently to reduce those input costs, um, and whether there's sort of peer learning networks through AHDB that people can tap into. Um, and I know we certainly have things like that through Soil Association and other organisations um, that do sort of peer learning networks. So just whether you're seeing an increase in people interested in those kind of approaches of different management? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. From, from what my understanding is, more people are looking at cover crops and legumes, definitely, um, as a way of managing input costs as well. <clears throat> but I didn't know whether, you, from the session earlier, um, the two farmers that were on the end, one of them was a strategic farmer as, as well, and a monitor far we have strategic farms, monitor farms, and that's a really good way of um, learning, peer learning, like you say. And it was really interesting point around, you know, sustainability practices um, and biodiversity practices, IPM practices. A lot of them are quite similar, uh, but it was really interesting to see, you know, uh, that somebody actually said their margins had improved on the back of that. And uh, I do think you're right, you know, one size doesn't fit all, um, but the more information that we can have available and um, so that people can explore the different options the better definitely um, and i think that's a really good way of learning i don't know thanks just a quick thing yeah and that, <clears throat> i think you know becoming more organic where it suits about is fine but i mean the, the issue is that i think there's more you can put a lot more energy and time into working out even better techniques whether organic or otherwise to save because to saving a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer has got a huge value at the moment so I think it's putting uh, the emphasis on knowledge and spending time in the field and not just rattling off a sort of recommendation. I mean, now it pays more than ever to, to, to invest, whether it's organizations or farms themselves, to investigate where they can tweak and improve things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there, there, there is a market for organic malt. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good market. And uh, there's, a, there's a good philosophy behind, uh, you know, the organic, organic principles. But... In terms of uh, producing enough barley for the brewing and distilling sector, there's, I, really, I really can't see that as a direction we would, uh, we would go. And I think if you look at the EU Green Deal, the, the, which was looking at 25% organic across Europe, the impact assessment showed a 20% showed a drop in, in barley production, which, which would mean bringing barley across from other parts of the world. And I think that would be going in the opposite direction to the way the organic movement would like to see things move. We don't, don't really want to see huge boatloads coming across from Australia, for example, to supplement uh, uh, sort of lower production yields in the UK. Yeah, and I, I agree entirely with your comment on taking learnings from the organic sector and using it in, you know, mainstream agriculture because it comes back again to good husbandry. We as a company um, have been active, actively involved in the EU Green Deal. Um, <clears throat> In my previous global role, 
we, we've been developing a range of foliar nutrient products that are purely suited to organic farming. So we've had to change everything from the sources of the nutrients to the different wetters, etc., that go into the finished product because of the regulation changes in Europe. You know, historically they've used the existing products. Um, we've spent a lot of time and effort with the, the chemical teams doing that. Um, the current issue we're facing is we then go back to the markets, we go to France. Okay, what premium can you get for this product that's suitable for organic farming over the same product that's used in conventional farming? And that premium's not enough to cover all the development costs we've had. Um, yes, we're looking at green ammonia. We look at the use of biostimulants, and a lot of the biostimulants are from natural sources. Um, there is work to be done on that still, but again, there's learnings we can take from other sectors to bring into mainstream agriculture. Um, and again, it goes back to collaboration and actually cooperating with each other and working better as an industry across all sectors. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Gentlemen there. You questioned to start with about the use of, of good land in Lincolnshire for, for uh, biodigesters and whatnot. Now, as an industry, all we've ever done is produce energy. Now, the general public have stopped paying for energy in the form of food, but they will buy energy in the form of gas, electricity, or anything like that. So why should we not follow the trend that's been set by the public, because that's what they want. They don't want food. The other thing I would like to say is we just have to remember that three mis missed meals creates a riot, and that won't take long to happen. Yeah, I think fundamentally, what do the public want? They want cheap, convenient food. That's what they want. Um, you know, if I sit down and talk to, to my dad when he was my age, around 45, 50% of his disposable income went on food. My, excuse the size, but mine is no way near that. You, you might think it is but when I stand up, but honestly it isn't. Um, because again, we want convenience, you know, and I, I have lots of friends who are not involved in agriculture. And I do lots of talks to, you know, whether it's WI associations, village discussion groups, primary schools, um, just to try and get the message out there of food, where it comes from and its value. Um, and it's, it's so much easier having those conversations with the older generation because they understand it. The younger generation throws far too much away, which to me tells me food is too cheap because you won't throw away something if it had a value. Um, best before dates, et cetera, et cetera, the, the list goes on. Um, for me, what we need to do is continue to educate the consumer where their food comes from and what goes into making our food. Um, and you look at things like Open Farm Sunday, what a fantastic success that has been to get the inner towns, the inner city public out into the fields and let's showcase what we do and what we do well. Um, doesn't answer the question directly, but I think for me it's all about education. Um, and, and as a businessman, you know, you've got to do what's right for your business. Um, you know, my concern is if we go too far one way, as, as I think we have, you know, if we're being brutally honest with ourselves in agriculture, when we look at weed resistance, pest resistance, disease resistance. Most of it we've brought on ourselves, unfortunately. Um, so it's about addressing that, that balance. We can't go too far one way. Um, <clears throat> and nitrogen, as we are a nitrogen manufacturer. Um, you know, we've had the conversations out there. When, you know, when we use technology, pr prime example, we use technology uh, and, and it, Two years ago, at the cost of nitrogen at the time, that technology would save a farmer 15, 20 pounds a hectare. You know, the risk at that point was, well, I've spent all this money, I'll just continue to do it. Now it's 90 pounds a hectare saving. Um, 
people start to listen. Um, but we've been banging that drum for a long time. So, so for me, it goes again, let's, let's control what we control. Um, but sustainability is a buzzword, but it's, it's economic and it's environmental for me. Just, just a quick comment on that. I mean, I mean, this is a point, really, where we're learning new tricks. And the price, price of fuel is, for example, pushing people into the electric car market. And uh, people, are th pe people are thinking differently. And to coin a phrase from yesterday's UK Agricultural Partnership meeting, don't waste a crisis. This is the time to learn to do things better. And we need to take the learnings from that and not let that disappear within the next decade. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so... It's a good point. I think what, in terms of biofuels, it, what the consumers are actually paying for is car cutting carbon of fuels, whether it's uh, petrol, diesel, or biogas, etc. So actually, far, that's what the money is coming from to support those biofuels. Now, the issue at the moment is that that money isn't could be coming into agriculture because agriculture can cut carbon emissions. And I think with this issue with land getting taken over to plant trees, etc., there is an urgent need <coughs> to find carbon funding to actually support agriculture and not work against it uh, and I think the biofuels is one example we need to produce food uh, and we can cut emissions quite a lot and I think but there is a gap at the moment the certainly the policy side thank you yeah I just wanted to add really on on that I think the point you were making was land sharing not land sparing and working together sort of delivering environmental um, challenge delivering for environmental challenges, as well as food security as well. And I think it's important to remember food security is delivering nutritious food for consumers and it's working throughout the supply chain to work with consumers and say, um, really understand the value of food, definitely, and reduce waste along the way. Uh, so I, I think it's not just thinking about food security and sustainable objectives in a different sort of manner, in a different conversation. I think all of these challenges, um, whether it's now and whether it's going forward, um, should be looked at as a holistic approach and, and trying to tackle all of them at once. Thank you. I'm just going to throw a couple of things out there to, to maybe put this into context. I heard, heard a figure quoted uh, fairly recently that an area the size of China is used to produce food that isn't uh, consumed. Uh, and just another interesting we'll call it a fact, that the food system globally as a whole accounts for about one-third of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that the, the gentleman's question is actually sort of quite, quite pointed in terms of, you know, how do we value what we produced and, and, and how it's used. Anyway, uh, I think we've got one time for one more question. Gentleman. Uh, Ken Rundle, <coughs> formerly with SIUC. Very simple, quick question. I'm retired now, so I'm probably reading the wrong uh, publications, but I haven't seen quoted recently the, the amount of grain reserves in the world. It used to be a kind of standard figure about three months. It strikes me that uh, with, what with everything happening, there must be a figure down which can perhaps get the politicians thinking hard about agricultural policy and their attitude towards food growing. Thank you. Great question, I think, to, to end on. Um, well, it's 97 days, and it was this year, and it was 114 back in eight years ago, uh, which was high. So, but 97 is actually still reasonably high because it's been down in the 80s and even the 70s. I think the issue is where it is, and a huge chunk of it is held by China uh, and one or two other states. So they're hoarding stuff. So the actual the free stocks in some of the exporters, uh, and whether we can actually get them, is really the issue. Um, so yeah, they are. They're certainly lower than they were. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that as well. I think in terms of global stocks, they are tight, definitely. I mean, and in terms of that Ukraine picture, we aren't seeing as bigger volumes of exports. Um, but I mean, some of that grain is, is still in the country. It, there's questions around the quality, um, where it's been stored, um, and how quickly it can get out. But it is, it is a lot of it is still there. Um, so you're right, in terms of global availability, that's definitely playing into the prices um, and the change in those trade dynamics. Um, and I think on, on top of that, and to those major exporters, um, their trade restrictions as well, the politics playing into that picture. Um, so I know when the first outbreak between the war between Russia and Ukraine, a lot of countries turned to India. Um, so India have put an 
ban on exports for private exports. They are still exporting for um, food security reasons, but that also plays into that picture as well of a different trade dynamics and the challenge that it is to get grain to where it needs to be. Yeah, just a quick comment on the similar theme. Uh, as, as well as the food stocks, is the future food availability. And the, I, I've heard, heard some staggering statistics that, for example, China is the biggest landowner in Australia. And uh, Ch China are actively purchasing food businesses across the world. And if you're a buyer from a supermarket looking for exotic fruits, you'll be competing with Chinese buyers because the Chinese uh, uh, sort of growth in the Chinese uh, requirements for food is, is, is staggering. And it would only take a small geopolitical uh, problem uh, to cause huge ruptures in the world market. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question, if anybody's got a burning question. I, ha I have one in case we don't. No? Okay. Um, some of the conversation's been around collaboration and cooperation across different parts of the, of the sector. So. Uh, what medium do you think would actually help achieve that? W what framework, what platform from government would, would help achieve that? Well, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling by saying I, I, I think for well, speaking on behalf of the malting and distilling and brewing sectors, the International Barley Hub gives us the opportunity. And for those that aren't aware, we've got 30 PhDs being funded and a lot of that work is about sustainable agriculture. Uh, we've got an active, active uh, program looking for students at the moment, so this is going to run for the next eight years. And if you want to know more, just go onto the International Barley Hub website. In fact, you can find recorded seminars uh, on there, which also are well worth going and uh, listening to. Uh, yeah, I'm... Um, um <laughs> Coming from south of the border, I don't think I'd want any involvement from our current government on anything um, because I think the whole politics currently is as shambolic as I've ever known it. Um, but bringing it back to the real world, in terms of um, agronomic collaboration, there's so much already happening out there that you can get partnered in with. You know, how many people have been to their AHDB monitor farm? How many people haven't when they're on the doorstep? How many people have engaged with the Yen project? How many haven't? There is so much already going on that you could engage with. Um, so I think from, from the sort of crop production aspect, there's a lot already out there. You just, just, just go and engage. You know, my, my final message to anybody is just engage with it you might actually learn something. Um, and if you go to it and you spend two hours at a meeting and you come away with one thing, that's two hours well spent in your day. Yeah, really good question. I think you can promote supply chain collaboration in many ways, conversations to start with, um, research, and like you say, Phil, lots of um, HDB events going on, monitor farm events, strategic farm events. And I think... Um, talking about issues in a cross-sector ma manner um, and talking about challenges together. And I think that really plays into the picture of, you know, everyone's facing the same challenges um, and engaging with those challenges and presenting those solutions and using events like these um, to promote discussions um, and get as much out of it as possible. And just to say, you know, is to value what you've got, which is what everyone's saying, I mean, I think the potato sector have lost some information in the marketplace that was very useful for growers. Uh, that's, that's not there now. Uh, we've still got a lot of that in the other sectors, like cereals. Um, so use it or you know, potentially lose some of these things. Okay, thank you. So yeah, lo lots of opportunities for, for engagement and learning. Now, th th this is a conversation, so I'm going to call the meeting to a close now, but please bear in mind, it's a conversation and we can carry on these sort of discussions sort of one-to-one -one as we're running around. Have a look at the, uh, the display stands and the uh, and the trials. So, uh, could you please thank our panelists for their time and contributions? Thank you.